Good morning, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to another in the JBBC virtual BizZone series. My name is Sansia Campbell, and I am your host for this morning. Um, so this month, we're in a new month of September, even though we're at the 13th, it's the new month, it's the first session for the month of September, and this month we're focusing on distribution and customer management. And so what we're gonna be focusing on for this particular presentation this morning is building customer loyalty. We're going to explore if there is such a thing. We're gonna look at branding, engagement, and of course the pursuit of community, which has become so important as we build businesses and brands so that we can extend the life of, of the small businesses that we seek to help to position so on in our local market. Now, this morning, our presenter is the affable Janine Taylor, and she is the Marketing Services Unit Manager here at the Jamaica Business Development Corporation. She is a marketer's, she's a marketer at heart. Everything to do with marketing. She knows. She's like a walking encyclopedia, encyclopedia when it comes to marketing. So I know that this, this morning, we're going to be learning so much from her as it relates to how you can position your businesses for branding, for engagement, and getting that community that is so important to building your business and your brand. So just to give you a little bit about Janine, her professional background includes marketing, of course, strategic planning and operations management, as well as she's a development management specialist. Her academic background includes a master's of science in psychology, master's of arts in arts and culture management, as well as a postgraduate degree in poverty alleviation and international development. Personally, of course, she enjoys music with honor. On a, in another part of her personal uh, passion as well is to contribute meaningfully to the development of the Jamaican economy. And that's what you'll find with a lot of us here at the JBDC. We are passionate about nation building, about having a better economy. And so this is why we do what we do. So this morning, as I said, our theme is building customer loyalty, branding, engagement, and the pursuit of community. Just a few reminders, the session this morning will definitely be recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel later this week. We invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can be notified when new content is uploaded. Uh, we also have a brand new website, www.jbdc.net. Please check it out at your earliest convenience. I am certain that you will be wowed and you will find a lot of useful information on the website as well. And of course, we're gonna be posting our evaluation form for this morning's session in the chat. So we ask that at your earliest convenience, you fill that out. Our web address key shop is www.jbdc.net. So having said all of that, all of that mouthful, I am now going to move out of the way and make way for this morning's presenter, Ms. Janine Taylor. Good morning, everyone. And it's my pleasure to be here with you to share nuggets on this very, very important topic called customer loyalty. And I think I want to start by disrupting the title just a little bit by saying, while we need to make sure that our businesses are centered around the customer, the customer has no obligation to be loyal to you. And that is the, that is the crux of the matter. However, given whatever experiences they may have, whatever assurances they may have in dealing with your brand, your products and services, and your general um, offering and experience that they may have with you is what generates a natural loyalty. And I wanted to start by putting that on the table because a lot of times when we hear discussions about customer loyalty and customer service, 
we tend to think of ways of manipulating the way a customer may perceive the business or coming up with um, gimmicks and promotional strategies to buy this loyalty. And so what we want to make sure of is that we understand that for you, the seller, you are seeking to invite and entreat customers to spend their monies with you and the customer is seeking a solution that they may deem to be of a particular value, right? So if you are not actually trying to understand the customer, then you are basically going to be shooting in the dark and making a lot of assumptions about what the customer may view as a reason to be loyal to you. So what are we gonna be talking about today? So today, the discussions will basically focus on these key points that I have on the screen here. First one we're gonna be talking about is, at the core of this discussion, we must always remember that customers are people just as we are people. And so we all are living in a particular kind of environment. We all have a context that we are coming from. And we need to look at, in general, we're not talking about our specific market segments now, but in general, what is happening in the environment that will affect our customers and the way they, their buying behavior unfolds, the way they perceive things, and even the way they, they determine value. Then we're gonna be talking about how well do we know our customers? And I can tell you that um, over the years, we have been interacting with a lot of business owners and things like that. And a typical question that we may ask is, do you know how many customers you had in a particular year? And we may get a number. Then we may say how many of those customers were repeat customers and how many were new. And in many instances, I don't want to start quoting statistics because I don't have the statistics, but I can tell you that my personal experience is in many instances, we don't know as businesses how many customers we saw, how many of them were repeat customers, how many of them were new, what their perceptions of the business were. You would basically say, well, everybody seems pleased when they do transactions with us. And so I would give myself a five or a four or a three out of five, not necessarily providing evidence of what customers are saying about them. And so, we're gonna talk a little bit about how well do you know your customers. Then we're gonna talk about what key concepts should be at the top of your mind as it relates to our current buying behavior patterns that we see in the marketplace. What matters to customers? The power of the tribe and in maybe about 2010 to 2020, this concept of the tribe has been building and building. And the important thing about the tribe, you know, is that the tribe is not necessarily your customer. The tribe is somebody who has an interest in a particular subject matter. And this group of persons have an interest in that subject matter. And your business or the products and services that you're providing is somehow aligned or related to this subject matter. And so even though these persons may not be purchasing from you, they have a significant impact on your business because they are having discussions around something that impacts your business, right? And last but not least, we will talk about some strategies for engagement because at the end of the day, if we're gonna be talking about customer loyalty, then we're gonna be talking about knowing your customers and to know your customers, you have to be engaging with them. They have to be talking to you and you have to be talking to them. And how does that work, right? So what's happening in our market environment? Customers have choices. They are faced daily with a number of choices for a particular solution that they may be looking for. At the top of their mind, they are, they are assimilating some variables in their heads that determine in their own conscience what is 
value for the money that they are going to spend? What is the most valuable option out there for me to choose? And they're going to be making a choice based on that. In order for them to be able to even see you or know that you're a part of that choice pool, you have to be accessible. And we talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about how some companies may use digital because it is not, it is not always applicable to say digital for all types of businesses in terms of how far and how deep you go digital, but you must at the end of the day have some form of digital access because the buying behavior of consumers now, they are accessing at the first point of a digital, digital point. They're looking for you in the digital space. Once they hear about you, the first thing they do is Google and see what comes up about you. So there's no working around that, but then we need to understand the nature of our business, what works specifically for our business and how we use that to enable accessibility. The other thing they would want to know is, especially as we talk about digital, is how reliable, because now we're doing transactions across borders. We're doing blind, somewhat blind transactions. Yes, we're looking at the photo. We are waiting in anticipation to see if what is in the photo is generally what is going to be delivered. Will it fit me the way it fit the model? You know, and all of those questions will come up. And reliability here does not necessarily mean that you you had a flaw in your product or business, but simply how satisfied and please the client was in terms of their expectation versus the reality of the transaction and what they got at the end of the day. So it makes no sense to even argue with a customer. If I, if I go into any business and I see the, the business persons arguing with the customer, I really start to question myself in terms of, are we recognizing that this person is giving you something that you need in exchange for something that you have and that there needs to be some kind of dialogue for, for whatever issues to be resolved versus seeing the customer as just a transaction, right? And of course, there is the matter of value. Now, if customers are people, regular human beings, just like the rest of us. One of the first things you need to do before you even take up a book about customer service, before you even try to understand what strategies are there for customer loyalty, I want to give you an exercise and I'm going to, want to challenge you to do this exercise. I want you to observe yourself for a week going about your daily task and doing transactions and examine how you feel as a customer in each of these exchanges. What comes up for you as a thought? What is going through your mind when you, when you decide to go and do a transaction? And then just remember that everybody else is a human being just like yourself and they are going through the same thought process. Yesterday, I was going to, to, to go and look at purchasing a uniform at a company. I have never been there before. All I have is a name and address. And based on the location, the first set of fears I had was, will there be parking? Something as simple as that was giving me anxiety. When I got there, I had to park outside and I'm saying, will the car be there when I go back out there, given the nature of the security issues around the road and so on now? And I'm in, the, I'm in the establishment and all I can think of is I need to move fast. I don't want to even hitch. I don't want to look to the left or the right. I just come out. I didn't have what I want. I left because I didn't feel safe. So in, in, a, in the context of the customer, this, these are all the things that are going on in the customer's mind as they try to do business with you. And you have to be mindful that the customer is operating in an environment where there is a lot of noise. So generally speaking, because we don't know your market segment, so we can't get down to the nitty gritty of what that market segment may be experiencing in the environment. But generally speaking, these points are affecting everybody. There's economic turmoil. Whether we want to believe it or not, there's economic turmoil because our disposable income 
is depleting. The value of our disposable income is, is, is significantly declining. And therefore we understand that I am now going to become more conscious of how I spend my resources. I'm going to not necessarily try to find something cheap, but I'm going to start evaluating the economic impact it's going to have on me, given that I'm in an unstable economic environment. A number of persons have lost their jobs. A number of persons have been displaced. A number of companies have redesigned their entire business model and doing contracts. So there is not as much stability in employment. Persons have to be thinking, okay, I have a contract for one year. I need to put something in place just in case I don't get a renewal. All these things are happening. They are realities. And every time you have a reality such as that, it is going to influence how much a customer is willing to be loyal to you. So therefore, you have to be mindful of the fact that they are operating in this environment. There is global unrest. So therefore, we have security-related issues, right? So now we would see a lot of persons on social media. It's now trendy where you would have the, the webcams and, and those standard security features where in the past, only a company that maybe felt it was significantly valuable would invest in a security system or even a camera or, you know, even the taxis now they're putting cameras in cars and things like that to, to ensure that they can get evidence in the event that something happens. So at the global level, there is war, real life war, bombs upon bombs, people dying every day. Life becomes questionable. What is the value of life? People start to get philosophical and all of that. How are you understanding this dynamic as the customers come in to your establishments to do business? There's political uncertainty and concerns about environmental landscape. You are, in an, you are on an island and a number of us will be going to the beaches. And for a number of those beaches, you can't even step foot in them anymore because of all the debris and things that are depleting the shores of those beautiful beaches that we take for granted, right? So now, how are you kind of sending this message? I saw an article coming out this morning that I think it's Red Stripe is offering $30 for the return of the bottles. What you, when you see a company doing that, they're sending a message out there about recycling. And that is something that is critical to the preservation of the environment, at least the environment that we have left, because there was huge consumerism, everybody buying, 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 spending, spending, having a grand time, manufacturing, using all sorts of practices that were not, um, it, was, it was fast paced, it was high, Vol volumes and stuff like that, but nobody considered the environmental impact this would have. And of course, there is now the, the discussions about the different generations, the Gen Z, the millennial, the this, the that, the that. And in some instances, when you hear companies speaking about their customers in this way, about the generations, almost with disdain, you know, like these generation of vipers, they will not conform to the regular um, ways of our, how we did things and they're so disruptive and they're not loyal and they're, they are people who have choices and can make their decisions in any way they want to make that can impact how well your business survives. And so we have to change the posture and the way we view them as if there's some level of, entitlement that we feel to the customer and there is no such thing it's imaginary the customer still gets to choose if they want what you are offering and there's a whole host of other things happening in the environment and the reason why i brought up this is we're talking about customer loyalty we're talking about customer satisfaction we're talking about an environment that has a number of um, trauma-based activities happening in the society. And so 
when that customer, if you have a physical store, walks in, or if that customer goes off on your social media pages with a massive ranting and raving, and you're saying, this person is crazy, why are they doing this? Understand that they are operating within a particular environment that is generating this type of behavior. And so you're not going to be immune to it or, or be able to avoid the fact that whoever this customer is that you're trying to build a relationship with and build loyalty with is operating in an environment that is impacting them both positively and negatively. And it's important now to be mindful of that. Yes? All right. So the first thing we left on the table, all customers are operating in an environment that is impacting them either in a positive way or a negative way. You need to be mindful of that environment and identify what potential impact that might be having on your customer as they seek to do business with you. So the assignment for that one is go out for a week, pay a lot of attention to your personal experiences as a customer, journal it if you must, and then reflect on your personal experience and ask yourself if you are factoring in some of these things in your businesses and in your business processes and so on. And, and, and what is the mirror saying to you from that experience? Trust me, you'll, you'll be surprised the things that you unearth with just doing that one thing. So now let's talk about the customer a little bit. At the beginning of starting a business, you have a product or a service and you are coming up with some sort of hypothesis that this particular good or service is going to meet the needs of the market and the market will see it as a solution. You do your product development, you put it out there and you test it. You have an hypothesis, you have to test it. It's okay at this point to not really and truly necessarily know everything about your customer because you're making some assumptions. You're not really dealing with them yet. You don't have any empirical evidence to suggest anything other than maybe what somebody else has experienced, a competitor, or what you have experienced, or some general sets of information. But when a product or service comes out on the market, that product or service stands on its own in terms of how the customer attaches themselves to it. So all the things that you would have assumed before, you need to verify if they are so. And so we can understand that at the startup phase, you may be guessing and spelling what you know about the customer. But the minute you do that, first transaction, you see that first transaction? That first transaction is where the conversation starts. You had a, a hypothesis, you had some assumptions. Are you asking the customer any question to validate if those assumptions were, were on point? What was the customer's experience? Would they buy it again? Um, would, they, would they recommend it to somebody else? These are the standard conversations that you should have with your customers because what we should be seeing in any business is a, the desire and the intention to get to know your customers, the person who decided that they wanted to try your goods or services. That's your customer, right? So once you have validated that there is a market for your product, you begin the engagement process. And the thing about the engagement process, you know, like why would you be asking them these questions is that you should expect in the early phase of the business to be modifying, modifying and continuously improving the business and improving the quality of the service delivery in order to address whatever concerns. Sometimes it's not even a negative feedback, you know, it may be somebody saying, so why you guys never add purple and gray? Because, you know, the, you know, just as an example. And you may hear that one, and then you may hear three more persons saying that. What you have happening there is a product improvement 
cost potential or some kind of product development potential. And when the customer see that you would have now factored in their feedback, this is where the loyalty starts coming into play because as the customer becomes vested or feel that they are vested in what you are creating and that you are actually taking their feedback and plugging that back in, they now feel that they have a personal vestedness to this, right? Now, I'm gonna say this for point three about branding. This is also another observation. I think I would have done a branding workshop before and I pointed out how many clients come into JBDC without a brand. That for me is an amazing thing because it is the same as walking out on the street without a name. And the this distortion of what we understand to be a brand. It's not the company's name, it's not a logo, it's an identifying mark and experience. There's a whole host of things bundled under that word called brand. And over time, as persons interact with this identifying marker, they start to assimilate a sort of personality or some sort of description that they assign to that brand. If you don't have the brand, what you have happening is that you are doing transactions and you're actually creating equity. You're you are generating some sort of value in what you're offering, but it doesn't have a name. It doesn't have an identifying marker. It doesn't have something for me to refer to when I'm saying, send this person here, send this person there. So the brand is a sort of communication tool for me to be able to identify you amongst everybody else on the market. The attention that you pay in that brand also influence the, the customer's behavior because if it has a word in it that goes against what is you know typical in the society, you know, maybe there's a word in it that boy they don't like or they don't like that color because it is associated with this or that. These are things that have significant potential to affect customer loyalty. You will actually find that customers can, it can in some instances be irrational, right? The reasons that they give for not buying or reasons that they give for not shopping in a particular location. You'd be surprised to hear the, the reasons that they give. And oftentimes it's some very small things. It may be um, even misunderstandings in how a customer service rep might have greeted the customer, they, they might have run a little joke that the customer didn't feel was um, appropriate. Some very simple thing. When you have this brand, you now have to determine, you have to define what the brand stands for, what values does the brand stand for. And it's not words, if it's only words and you're just putting it down on paper, they are going to seek to test you to find out if what you're saying is true. So it has to now translate into what they experience. So if you say your brand stands for honesty, then everything you do must embody the truth. Something goes wrong and say, boy, we messed up and we're gonna fix it. So if you say you embody honesty, then ensure that the brand is staying true. And as you get to know the customers, it's important to have this sort of feedback around these elements, right? That is, it is no longer enough to just say you have a great product with high quality. Is it, is it enough to say you have a, a, a great product and it's high quality? In a recent um, discussion with some clients, I heard a client saying that the, the customers don't know good things. Jamaican customers don't know good things. And that, I don't know if that's true. I can't speak to it. But one of the first things I asked myself was, how well are you communicating? That is, is, this, is this just your perception that it's a good thing because you created it and you had a lot of sweat, blood, sweat, blood and tears going into it and you think it is the best thing since sliced bread and the market is saying, 
not interested. And then you turn around and say, well, the market is dumb because they are not seeing the value of what you are offering versus asking yourself, how are they perceiving this product that I'm offering? I know that it's a great product. I know that it is high quality, but the truth of the matter is the decision maker, the customer has to interpret it that way. So we would spend a lot of time and effort on the product and we sit in the lab and we, you know, iteration after iteration and we come up with a masterpiece and we see, we say, yes, this is it. And at no point in time was the customer engaged. All we are doing here is making assumptions about what the customer will perceive as a great product. And so while we are doing this kind of development, it is very important to speak to people, go around, have conversation, observe, observation studies are, it's easy, just going to any, any retail space that would have similar products and just sit down and observe people, observe how they move around, observe how they go about making the decisions they're making, observe what anxieties come up for them. These are things that determine the loyalty part of the customer experiences over time. And they're gonna take their time to determine that. Yes, the great product, this is what customers will say to you. It is my expectation that you would create a high quality product. That's a given. So when you come out with your ads and you say, boy, well, this is the high quality, da, da, da. the customer is saying, that's a given. That's an expectation that I have that if you're going to try to sell me something, it must be a good quality. It must be safe. It must, there are just some standard things that the customer already expects of the product. So this is not something to go out and beat your chest and say, oh, I have a great product, it's high quality, it's safe. It's a, these are expectations. So what is necessary for the customer experience has a lot to do with the emotional side, the perception side, the psychological side, the engagement side, the experience side of it, because a lot of the functional parts are already expected by the customer. In fact, they're they gonna be marking down. So they come in with an expectation, it doesn't meet it, they start marking down, right? I say, okay, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like this, right? Because those things are standard expectations that they have. In this generation now, in this era of the influencer, boy, I must tell you, I struggle with this, um, concept of the influencer because what this is saying is that one person, one person that I view or respect the, their, their opinion on something can determine whether or not I buy your product. They can determine whether or not I stay loyal to your product. They can determine that this product is good and this one is not. The one person's opinion in a five minute or not even so long, maybe a 30 second video can make or destroy your business. One person, one YouTuber, one Instagrammer going on and say, I went to this restaurant, the food was horrible, Everybody stop coming to your restaurant. That is the power of the influencer. And I find that depending on the generation of the business owner, it is not viewed as anything in, in you know, I don't need to look at that. That's the young people thing. Once you have a business and you are in this era, it's important, not, not necessarily that you're going to yield to the fact that the influencer can, can determine what happens, but to understand how the customer is influenced by this person, how the customer is determining whether or not you make it or not, you know? So you have to now look at 
if an influencer came into my establishment, what would happen if they went back out and gave a review, right? The next thing that we have to consider is how well do you know or understand your customers and the context through which they have engaged with you? Now, what, what do we mean by, by that? And, you know, some things like the old broom, know the corner. There are some, some old, 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 old time practices that will never die. Somebody walks in to your company and your operator asks, how are they doing? How did they hear about us? That's a very important question, you know. For every customer that you ask how they heard about you gives you information on where they are tapping in, where they are coming in, because we have a lot of noise. The market access channels have been wide open. It could be a friend, it could be uh, 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 the Google search, it could be any, any, any poss possible reason could have led the customer to you. It's important for you to ask them what led them to you. What is the context that the customer had that this made them decide to walk in and decide to, to do a transaction with you? What was the context they were, what were they doing when they decided to make an online purchase? How much do you understand about that customer and the process, the journey that they went through to get to you? Because what you're going to find is that if you want to build customer loyalty and you want to manage your customer experience, the customer experience starts way before they came in to you. And so it's important for you now to understand that journey that led them to you and to see what aspects of that can you influence. Because that now is where you are going to, to develop your competitive advantage. Because if you can understand where to track them to and start giving them experiences from that place, then again, you have the potential of creating a very loyal customer. And the next thing is understanding the importance of the era that we are in and that the customer is no longer a taker. Why I want a shoes, so all the place I can go to get a shoes and um. You know, this is the only shade black, you know, it might have different shade of black, or this might be suede and it's suede still in, so I have to buy suede. Um, you know, that was the past. Customer comes in you now and says, but, but I, I like it, but I you know if you didn't have it a little shorter, if it was a little, and you see them start getting very specific about specifically what they want, and they know that it is not, not, not so hard now to find the alternatives, right? So what you, are, what you are experiencing is that the customer has a choice that they did not have before. If this was the restaurant that I used to eat, and I know that when I go to this restaurant, the food normally tastes good, that would be, in the past, that would be what I would use to decide to go back. And so the loyalty would be inevitable because of my, com my comfort zone is that I know that your food tastes good. What am I going to do now? I want to go to a restaurant and I am trying to figure out where to go. The first thing I'm going to do is go on Google. Then I'm going to, to try to find out if they're on Instagram. And the first place that I am going to personally look at is the chat. Not the post, you know, not the post that you put up. I'm going to look in the chat and see what are people saying about this restaurant. It's some some might some guys say it tastes good, it tastes bad. Then they're going to store how many good good posts did they get? How many bad? Because we know the customer already knows that there is a difference in opinion. And in that process of looking into the chat, looking even at how you responded to something negative is what they are going to be looking at. And this is why we are now saying that customers are fickle. They are not fickle. They just have more information at hand and they have the ability now to 
move out of that comfort zone and rely on other customers, rely on what other customers are saying because they are saying, boy, we in this together, right? We're in this together. So if three other customers say, is a, is a number four, I can take a chance because customers are people like me. And one of the things that I know customers are looking for, they're no longer just doing it um, ad hoc or random. They're looking to see if you have taken on their recommendations. They are looking to see it. So I might recommend that, you know, you should have somebody at the front to help us to park. And then I come back next week and I have the same problem with parking. Immediately I'm saying, but I'm not, that's not business with me. They're not business with me. They don't care about me, my experience or what I suggest. So I am pointing you in the direction of this co-creating um, culture that is evolving and, and helping you to understand that you don't have to figure it all out on your own. Even if it's a new product, you, know, you may start sending out little questions and you'll be surprised how many persons are willing to respond to you and give you feedback. So that's what's happening in the, in the customer arena. So what are some of the key concepts that you should be paying attention to in this current environment? In the past, when we, when we would be asking you to define your customer segments, define your target market, persons would normally be describing demographics, age, gender, um, disposable income, some standard metrics, right? And you would identify these people and you would put them in a box and you would say that's your your customer segment, and this is a this is another potential segment, and this is your target market. What we what is a buzzword now, which is it's not really a buzzword, but we still have not adopted it in a number of our business. Is the customer persona, and what this is basically saying is that the customer is more than their demographics. They are about their psychology, they're about their behavior, they're, it's about their preferences, it's about their attitude, it's about the culture, it's about, it's about everything that defines the personality of that person. And understanding that although we are all different, there is a general thread that runs through those differences that create a persona. So when you are now describing your target market, essentially what you are describing is a person and you are describing how they go about making decisions. You are describing what they like, what they dislike. You are describing who their friends are. You are describing what they do, what their bedtime practices are, right? That is why for the skincare and makeup companies, you see them talking about their bedtime routine. Because a person has a bedtime routine and within that bedtime routine, they are using maybe some, some is three, some is all 12 products, right? So if I don't understand that bedtime routine and that bedtime process, I don't even know how to position my product to be one of those 12 products that the person is going to use. And so now we, now we also have access to the persona because they are coming on the social media pages and they are giving you insight into their lives, right? Not everything can be believed, but this is what they are projecting. And so therefore, if they are projecting it, that's what, there's going, that's what they're gonna do with their purchases. When you're going to their homes, you are going to expect to see. Um, recently, I saw a TikToker. I don't know what to call it because I don't know if she's an influencer, but. I saw one person on TikTok talking about uh, uh, a skincare product. Now, when you look at the product, and this is why I would talk earlier about, it's not about, first time it would be about the packaging and the, you know, the, the fanciness of the product, and that would be the, 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 the aesthetics. This was, uh, you know, the white bottle, like the really old time pharmacy white bottle. This is a, a product for blemishes right? 
and the person was saying, boy, they saw this TikToker recommending this product and they tried it and it worked. And I just sat down and I watched and I looked at all the comments. There is nothing fancy. It looked almost like, um, I think maybe it would have been like a photocopy label. No, I'm not telling nobody if we're going to do no photocopy label. You know, but I'm just saying, nothing about the product look fabulous. But I can tell every pharmacy in Jamaica will be getting a call about this product based on just how many reruns of other persons giving unsolicited testimony on the value, how, how good the product was to remove the blemish. While you have all the fancy skincare brands out there, the person's going to go in the pharmacy and ask for that white bottle. And you're going to say, I'm going to ask you, is that customer loyalty? I don't know if that could be perceived as customer loyalty, except that whatever the need is, which is to remove blemish, this product has proven to many different types of persons that it works. And so from that, the persona is built because you are now going to say, my customer persona for that product are going to be persons who struggle with acne, blemishes, struggle with maintaining a flawless skin or whatever. And they, they would have tried several. So this is now the conversation that you're going to start to develop to come up with the persona. What is the pain point they're experiencing? What typically would be their, their the outcomes? They have several unsuccessful attempts of, of getting rid of blemish. And you dig down into that and you come up with your persona and you start creating content now to attract these type of persons, right? The other buzzword is the customer journey. And the fact that we need to recognize that the customer's journey does not begin when they walk into your physical establishment or when they log on to your web page. The customer's journey begins somewhere in their own context, whether that is a conversation I might be having with somebody or it may be simply driving past, I could just be scrolling, killing time on social media and something pops up and something of interest is triggered by my unintentional use of social media. So understand that as you discuss the matter of customer loyalty, it's no longer um, make sure the discounts when they come in, it's no longer, I don't know what else some of those traditional things were doing, but it's not that anymore. It's empathy. It is understanding that the customer is a person and is coming from this maybe far old place before they actually got to you. And, and how do you come out of that um, establishment or that box that you are in to meet them along the journey for them to even know that you exist. The other thing that is happening in the in, in the marketing space is that these three words product, process, and physical environment, process and physical environment being added. So now I think maybe we are at seven P's the last time I checked. And physical environment. Now there's, there's a study that I read about physical environment and it is particularly um, important for persons in the services industry, as well as maybe corporate Jamaica. And that is, did you know that your car park, your parking facility is used to assess the quality of your business? Did you know that? Did you know that when employees are seeking employment with a company, that they actually use the vehicles parked in the parking lot to determine whether or not this is a place that would want to work? Yep. Did you know that because the consumer world is interested in the environment, that when you have a gardener that you think is the least important person in your in your team, 
that garden now trimming the edge on a nice round shape and the green grass, the, the absence of debris, the, the, the smooth um, road of the, the unchipped paint, the smell, the aroma, all of that is being used as a way to assess whether or not I want to do business with you. How you treat your employees. So if they, if they come in, or they, or they go out to another place and they see your employees branded and they just look miserable and uptight. They're going to say, but you look like that company that treat them, them employees, right, man? These mm -hmm. things are now going to be factored into when a customer decides, say, yes, you know, I really do. I will always do business with this company because this is what they stand for. Their employees are so pleasant. They seem so happy, blah, blah, blah. All these things factor for physical environment. And so, when, so when we're not even talking promotion don't even come up yet, you know, that, so you don't even have to do an ad. You don't even have to do an ad yet other than to just ensure that all the things that the, the person is experiencing, all the senses, the sight, the smell, the taste, the experience, the psychological impact, all of that is being factored into the customer experience. And all of that is being used to determine if I should do business with you. Your process. Um, have you ever tried to do business with someone? And um, I would say, especially for service related companies, we need to look at user-friendly processes. So if you have a, a way for the, for the customer to, to, to have some level of control, can they self-serve in your, in your establishment? Is there a, a user-friendly process that I go through? How long will it take for me at the front desk to be processed? The process, not necessarily the product yet, because there may be a product that I'm going to get at the end. But what is the process of engagement? How trained is your sales team, right? And do they embody the branded message that you are, you are communicating or is there a distortion? So your process is also another area that customers are going to build loyalty. It is this process is not necessarily the product, it's the process in a lot of instances that they will say, it was so easy, I just call, I just this. I know that, for example, some pars was doing that early in the, in the whole supermarket landscape. Early in the COVID response, they were looking at home deliveries and so on. In overseas, you have the Walmarts and all of those supermarket chains having drive-by pickup and ensuring that what I ordered, because this is now, when you ask yourself, as a consumer, um, why you want to go to the supermarket, right? First time, you want to go to the supermarket for the experience, yes? You have your list and you want to browse and you push the cart and you want the freedom to pick up this and pick up that. First of all, everybody afraid to go to the supermarket now because they're afraid when the cashier ring up the bill. So they don't want to do nothing spontaneous, which is going to naturally happen. Well, I'm telling my own tales, right? That I don't want anything that's going to trigger my spontaneity. So I would love to just order my goods, tell them the brand I want, the size and everything, and know that when the delivery come, supermarket, that cross off my list as a things to do. So those are some things when you talk about the process. Same thing with the the restaurants and their, their food delivery process when they couldn't, when you couldn't go into the restaurants to be seated. So when you when you look at these three things out of the seven keys, product, there needs to be some level of agility in the in the MSME's business to move with what the customer is moving with, to move with the environment in a quick pace. Ultimately, what you want is ease of doing business with you. Now, the other term that's out there is cancer culture. And earlier we spoke about the, the, the influencer's power. And cancer culture is social media power, digital power, where somebody can start a rumor. It doesn't have to be factual. 
and just say, I would have never go back to that place to go eat. And your restaurant cancel. Because by the time that spread and that conversation, me who never set foot in your nice, beautiful establishment, say, you know what? So much people can run. Cancel. And you stand up at the door wondering why nobody coming. And you know within yourself that you have a good product. And so that, that's a reality that exists in the environment and you need to know that it is there. The other thing you need to, to think about is whether or not your customer service is accidental or intentional. Because a lot of persons, when they, when they tell you that customers rate them five out of five, on that day, a customer came in and had a good experience with the cashier. And that customer leaves and says, this place is a great place to shop. But did that place put something intentionally in place to give that customer that particular experience? Is it the same experience for every single customer that walks in? That's what we mean by accidental customer service versus intentional customer service. Because again, if the conversation that is happening in the, in the digital space or in the, in the environment is mixed, what you will have is an indifferent potential customer. It needs to be very explicit, say, yeah, man, same thing, same thing that happened to you happened to me. I went in two seconds later, somebody was there to greet me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, not, um, not paying attention to the power of the tribe, to the power of the conversation of the tribe, because this um, notion of the tribe gives you a lot of forewarning in terms of what the trends will be. The, the power of the tribe, I was, um, well, clearly, I use social media. And there is a song, I can't remember the name of the group, but I know it's an old, old time dancehall song with these girls, these ladies, I don't know their names right now. And that song, I don't even know if it, I don't even remember what the buzz was around that song when it actually was released many, many years ago. What is happening on social media with the song? TikTok, Instagram, Facebook Reels. Persons are doing dance. There's a dance routine for the song. The dance, the moves are all standardized. And now you have the dance challenge, right? What do you think is happening with that song on the Black Bull so the charts right now? The song, they are buried a long, long, long time, you know? Nobody know about this song. Yeah. Just one person on earth the song create a dance routine and everybody wants to know. This is, a, this is the power of the tribe. The song has been on earth and I'm sure it is trending on the charts without even having the evidence I'm 100% sure it's trending. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't remember that song having that kind of buzz when it was originally released. I don't even know if the artists themselves even still sing our remember members and then they do a song, right? So if you don't understand that, then you truly are not paying attention to the power of the tribe. And this is why we're saying that you have, um, even if you are not into the whole social media, you know, I hear people say that I'm not into social media. It's a noise, da, 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 da. All right, I understand. I understand enough. But you cannot run no business with that approach. Find somebody in your team that is, because it is where the information happens, right? All right, so that's what we need to keep top of mind. So what matters for our customer loyalty? Um, should we go totally digital or no? There are some businesses that are not, it needs people. Some businesses need people. I can't imagine, for example, walking into an accommodation in the accommodation industry and um, being greeted by a, a self-checking kiosk and um, a map, some digital maps telling me where to find my room, 
And when I step in the room, I look a computer lady say, welcome to so and so. There, that may be the next 10 years, maybe that generation will find that appealing. I am still needing to speak to somebody, right? So some business models are not wholly suited for like 100% digital. We are customer trust and uh, there are anxiety. There are anxieties in the belief of whether or not the product will work or not, or it looks the way it should or so on. You still, you still cannot undervalue the need for physical presence. And so what matters is that you have digital accessibility. If you are, if all the persons in this um, session are business owners, first thing you do Google, Google your business on Google. No matter if you put anything on, on, the, on the digital space, just Google it and see what comes up for it. And if nothing comes up, then that's the same thing that happened to the, to the last potential customer that you could have had. You must have some level of access that matters because without that, customer loyalty you know, means that you have to stay present in mind. You must be like right there in front of the person for them to even remember them loyal to you. Remember, they have no obligation to remember you or your product. But if you are visible and accessible, then you, you generate a sort of relationship. Standard customer care will never grow old. Manners, good, good old manners. Yes. It will never grow old. Yes. Caring for people will never grow old. Assisting persons above and beyond will never, those are just standard. You don't need to read any textbook. You don't need to attend any webinar to just have manners, yeah. right? So standard customer care will never grow old. People matter, not data. Yeah. And by this, I mean, when it, as a retailer, you're going to look at your, 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 floor count, your, how many persons came in to the store, how many of that you convert. And you know that you have a sales start. You're going to say, okay, I need a hundred customers to come into this store. But at the end of the day, even though those are the metrics that you're running, and even though when you finish your end of month report, your metrics tell you that you are meeting all your KPIs and all your targets, at the end of the day, if those people disappear, your business disappears. So there is something called analysis paralysis and a lot of us get caught up in that and we're checking out the numbers and the sales going up, the numbers going up. And if COVID never teach you anything, let it teach you that people matter, right? If the place shut down and people can't go out, no entertainment industry, right? So people matter. So yes, it is important to have metrics and to have the numbers running, but don't get so caught up when you see them working that you are not paying attention to the core, the core driver of your business, which is the customer and how they are feeling, what are they experiencing. Inclusiveness. Customers do not want to be separated from your business. They want to have an input in what you are doing. So you have to now look at including them in your development process. As you continuously improve, you are continuous in, continuously improving based on feedback. So one of the things that you're going to find is customers are going to be looking on to say, are you trying to get feedback from me? In the absence of that, the customer is going to feel that they, their input doesn't matter. So you must be intentional in getting feedback from them and include them in your growing process. Include them in what you are doing. Get them involved in the backstory. So every company that is created has a story, either behind the founder or behind the product or something. Be very clear and 
honest and open with the driving force behind your business? Why do you do it even when you don't have a profit? Why, what, the, what about it drives you to keep doing it? Why do you want to provide this solution to customers? How do you feel when a customer is satisfied? What is your emotional business framework? right? It is not transactional. It has emotions involved. You have sweat, blood, and tears going on behind the scenes. Sometimes take them into the background of that. Take them into the back end of that so that they can get a sneak peek into what goes into your end result, right? Because we may come out, we may start to, to argue with you about a price, not knowing that you, you spent 24 days making this nice bowl. I don't know anything about making ceramic. So I would not necessarily have an appreciation as to why it may cost the, the price that it's, it's being charged for. So sometimes you have to give me insight as a customer into what goes into that. What is the purpose? Why does it matter? Why does this business matter? Get to the core of it and get vulnerable as well. Get vulnerable, tell them about the good and the bad. And those are some things that, these really capture some things that really matter to customers as they seek to make decisions about their loyalty to you. And just to, I sort of touched on this already. Um, the power of the tribe. Now, I mentioned earlier that the, the tribe includes more than the customer. So when you're talking about your, let's say you have a website, you have social media pages, you have a physical um, store or business premises. And um, let's say you're in construction. Let us use construction as a, as a, Construction is a good one because it's very tactile in nature. The nature of the business is very physical. You know, you're talking about lumber, steel, sand. You know, what could possibly be interesting about construction for Instagram? You may ask yourself that. Now, in order for you to understand what, what, are, what, what, what would a tribe be talking about that is related to your output called construction? I might be a young uh, in my 20s and I might be considering home, home ownership. I might be considering the fears of uh, renting somewhere or I might be considering the overwhelming task of building a home and, and how do I even start? I might be considering how do I get a loan? So how do I get a mortgage? What qualifies me for a mortgage? So as a construction company, you may ask yourself, you may think you need to put up, I, I'm not going to post a picture on a steel and sand. And that's, that's, that's a part of it. Letting them see how the thing unfolded from the ground up is one part of that. But then what else would the tribe be talking about? Affordability, um, quality, structure, what to look for when renting a home. What are some of the pitfalls in, in selecting a home in a particular um, area? What are some of the, the faster paced area? What makes this home this price versus that? What are what would the tribe be talking about? And in that tribe, they are talking about it, and you have a hundred people talking about it. Maybe 20 of those persons might be interested in making a purchase. But those 20 persons, they are, customers are seeking the input and validation of the tribe. They are seeking it out. You don't have any control over that, the fact that they want to have this conversation. So understand that the power of the tribe is that they, they are not necessarily the ones buying, but they can influence the person who is making the buying decision. The consumer tribe, is very fluid, it's not fixed, and they are not necessarily um, don't uh, ride or die. No, they are not ride or die, it's relevance that keeps the tribe. Um, are you relevant? 
for the topic that they want to discuss right now. It's ever evolving. They're, they're, the, the whole concept of the tribe and the whole concept of social media is predicated on freedom of expression. So therefore you cannot manipulate it. You cannot you know, trap it into behaving the way you, you cannot manipulate customer loyalty. You cannot, it has to be what they need and they have to be able to connect with you in, at all different levels. Influencers in, in consumer tribes matter because at some point in time, they are going to identify someone whose opinion they value. Whether we want to get philosophical about that, it is a reality. It is even, even for the person who is not necessarily using it as a decision marker, they are still tapping in to see um, what that person is, has to say about this matter. Understand that every business, every type of business, every, every business has a different type of Know who your tribe is. Because, okay, we understand that we need to have the tribe and we need to have the discussion, but you want conversion. At the end of the day, this is not just to, to just have conversation and yay, whoopee, whoopee. We want conversion. So we want to make sure that we are understanding what tribe has the potential to call, convert into revenue and business and traction at the end of the day. And, and zoning in on that tribe, becoming a part. So you are not going to own the tribe, you know. Let's be clear. You are a participant in the tribe. What you get is insight. You get information, you get access to people, and you get insight. You don't get to own it, right? But they can follow you if they feel that you have something valuable to offer them. Empathy, always come from a place of empathy because the tribe is very emotional. <laughs> the tribe is a very emotional grouping and they are going to express these emotions. And always remember that customers are real people. So that, that's what you need to know about the tribe, right? So I wanted to, to leave with you some strategies now for engagement because I looked at the topic and I spoke, I, I thought to myself, loyalty. Let's take the word customer out of it for a bit. And I asked myself, what generates loyalty? And the key element is relationship. And in order to have relationship, we know that we have to nurture it. We have to converse, we have to, exchange ideas we have to be willing to take feedback give feedback there's always an exchange going on in a relationship and from that there is what is being generated is a pattern of behavior and that pattern becomes predictable and as it becomes predictable the con the constant understanding that this is firmly going to happen every time or there's an assurance taking place over time loyalty is generated what we should also be mindful of is that as we generate customer loyalty we should also be mindful of not taking it for granted because it is not a permanent state of being a customer a customer's loyalty to your business and your brand and your products it's not a permanent state of being. It means that whatever the original benefit they were getting, they are still getting it or more. And so the, the loyalty is sustained, but it's not fixed. And so I have it. So I have these hundred customers and they are going to be with me forever and ever. No, you are going to have to constantly nurture that experience and nurture that relationship. So what is involved in, in the engagement process? getting into the story behind the brand they don't want to just hear about your products and and the product can do this and the product can do that they want to hear about the persons behind it they want to hear about how did the owner get into business what 
you know, what their backstory was. You have to be willing to be vulnerable and expose a little bit of that story to them. You have to be willing to create a context, whether that is through memberships, and you will find that in a number of business models nowadays, even if you're in the transaction-based business model, you have a sort of subscription-based um, attached to that to create this level of what the membership benefit is like versus the walk-in customer. So that's another, that's another strategy that you can use. Um, building the clubs, the customer clubs, um, through so if you are if you are a sports company for example you may want to have a fet and you may want to to have a lime that's not necessarily a part of your business model but it is creating a context for all the customers to come together into a space so you can sort of model what happens in the digital space with the tribes and social media incorporate the customer in your development process as the business grows let, you should not have a business development officer asking you about the makeup of your customers in a given year and you can't tell them how many, how many persons were repeat customers. Do you know what it means for a customer to make a purchase decision with you and decide to come back and make a second one? That is no mean feat. Something happened in the first transaction that made them come back. It is imperative for you to understand why they are coming back and improve on that why, right? So you have to look at incorporating the customer into every little nuance of your business, even, even as it relates to the product that you are planning to offer. Understand that you need to nurture lead. Um, for persons who do a lot of trade events and we do interaction, it's not all the time that you're going to go after a sale. You know, sometimes you can do an event or a promotional activity just to get to know your customers. So you can do a sampling and you're doing the sampling um, because you want to get customer feedback on the product. But when they come to sample the product, talk to them now, talk to them about the day, talk to them about what, what would make them buy this product? What do they think they should have improved? What else would you add? What would you subtract? Learn how to nurture leads because loyalty is not an overnight thing. It's something you have to build. And when you are starting off that kind of dialogue, what you are going to understand is that persons will, will come back to do business with you just because you had conversations with them outside of trying to sell them something. Right. As you look at customers, look at customers within the context of acquisition and retention. When you talk about customer acquisition, you are trying to get persons to come. You are trying to get new customers. The strategies and the, the tactics that you employ, I promise that's another session all in itself. That's a whole school, the customer acquisition, right? So those strategies are different. You're, you're talking to somebody that you don't know, they don't know you, and you're trying to encourage them to come in. But I don't want to say cheaper. Customer retention tends to be less expensive. Let me say it that way. The customer already understands your product, already knows about it. What are you doing to keep them? That's what customer retention is about. Customer loyalty is when it transcends all of those strategies and the customer is doing business with you just because of the relationship. And ultimately, that's what you want to get at. Um, that's it for me in terms of, you know, when we talk about customer loyalty, as I say, just don't feel that you're entitled to it. Don't feel that it is a fixed thing. It doesn't stop there you understand the person has a whole journey there are persons interrupting them along their way to come to you and that's how you lose customers right so at this point I open up the questions and come in all right um Chandris, i see your hand and i am going to I'm going to try it. I'm going to come to your question in a second. 
but I wanted to comment on the passion and practicality of the presentation that we just received. And I have a few questions of my own because I was making some notes, but Chandris, I'm gonna open your mic and allow you to go ahead with your question. Is she unmuted? Okay, right. good morning, everyone. Morning, Chandra. Um, so my question um, is this. Understanding your customer is crucial. Yes, agreed. But it is a case where the customer in giving the feedback would want you to create um, a totally different product from what your main product is. So for example, my business is Seaweed Cosmetics, where I make and sell natural based cosmetic products. And I lead with making the guinea hen leaf so for the business. In talking to like customers, first things would say, oh, you don't do um, skin lightening soaps or you don't do like body creams or facial serums. Now, initially, I never started with those products, but in considering, there may be one or two customers that are suggesting that I lead in that direction. What if it's a case now where do I change my product offering to offer more bleaching products, even though my brand is a natural herbal brand? Or do I still stay with what I currently have? Okay, so what I hear is a, an opportunity for you to create some kind of um, segment of your business model that deals with customization at premium. So once you're talking about um, customers asking for customization, you're talking about premium. But at the same time, remember we spoke about the branding and if the if they brand values, for example, the you spoke about like a bleaching cream or something like that. And you are, let's say your brand stands for everything that goes against that type of skincare, right? then you are going to have to make a decision to stand true to the brand message and say to that, help the customer to understand what your brand stands for. But if that's not the case, and if there is no distortion and there is no disruption in a business model, because I know that a lot of persons struggle with having too many products, because every time we need to create another product, it has implications for your inputs. Right, so that's why I've, I've mentioned the point about if you find that a number of customers keep coming in with these kind of special requests, then you need to package something now that's called customer customization. And you do consultation with the customer to better understand what they're looking for, ensure that you are documenting the specifics in what the customer is asking for, so that you're not making sample after sample after sample, so you have an agreement on what it is the customization should entail and you can charge premium for that. So that's a, that's a way that you can look at that. Now, if you find that in that customization process, there's a particular request that keeps coming over and over. And right there and then, you know, you have a product development um, situation on your, on your hand. And this is what we talk about, co-creation. So over time, the customers will start to see that their recommendation was factored in to the product mix. And you can even promote it as such based on popular demand. This is a new release. And you, when you build a story around that, you talk about how many times customers were asked for it and what went into the creation of it. So it's just a way of, um, based on what your resources are and how well you can respond to those requests, that would determine how you respond to it. All right. Thank you very much, Chandri. Exactly. Yeah, man. Um, just let us know in the chat if, if, they, if the response was sufficient for you, Chandri. Um, and thank you for your response as well, Janine. Great question to start off the question and answer segment. And I just want to encourage anyone else that has any question. Chandri said, excellent. Um, so anyone else that has any other question, feel free to just drop it in the chat so that we can address it. But like I said, I was making some little notes and 
I noted where you spoke about um, like in a retail business setting. What was it again? It was about having the customer data so that you can retain the customers. Now, one of the things I've noticed, a number of stores have taken it on, local stores, because I first saw this overseas where when you go into the store, they will take your email address or your phone number so that if anything comes up, they can connect mm -hmm. with you and stuff. And I noticed that a number of local stores have started it, but I was thinking about my hair shop in particular. I go in there every month and in there is always food, but I've never seen them engage with any kind of customer. Right. Um, any, anything to get the customer details or anything. How would they then be able to know that I am a repeat customer? That's the, that's the point. That's the whole point. Because what, what that setup is saying is that the customer is not at center of the business model. It is saying it's transactional. Right. We understand that the, we benefit when the customers come in and we want as many of them to come in and we want them to leave their money with us. Mm -hmm. And once they cash out and we get our sale, all is good. That's the end of the story. But we learned from the digital and flow experiences that there may be a period where that works, but if there is a choice that now comes up for the consumer, they are going to start looking at those soft things. Mm -hmm. They are going to start evaluating, but which one is more beneficial for me? Just like any relationship, yeah. you know? So I, we go out on a date every day. I you never ask me where I live. Me drive, you drive. We never ask me how I reach home. After a while, I'm going to say, but this person don't care about me. Yeah. You know, I, I don't even know if that happened, but anyway, I'm just saying <laughs> that you wouldn't want that to happen. No, so right. you want to, when you go into it now, we say that you need to have a little bit of emotion in there. Yeah. You need to have a structure. So you may, you may say your, your sales assistants are busy with that. You have a, a summer worker or an intern who is just like what they call them. Um, it's like a people, people person that's just there just to ask, is, are you getting through? Just to cue you. So you're going to the box now and they have these long lines. And the, the banks are sort of like in the monopoly side because you need to put your money in the bank. You need to do the transaction, which is so much different when you go to a banking establishment and they come in and they're asking you, what transaction are you here to do today? That you start to, you start to lose that tension. Mm -hmm. And it needs to slap away two hours enough. Yeah, we don't want to talk about the bank no, experience. No, I'm just saying. Because I, had, I, I had, had a recent bank experience that caused me to just out yeah. them on Facebook. But but going back to that, um, that my hair shop, and now that you're saying it, it is coming home to me that it's, re it's truly transactional. transactional. Because when you go into the store, as you're reaching, is there something I can help you with? And then they, right, so they direct you to the product that you have indicated that you want. And then your next move is to move to the cashier. Purely transactional, has nothing to do with no, how am I doing? Yeah. Did I enjoy my last purchase? Yeah. Is the product None working? Of None, of, None that. of that. Because even, even the question is the product working. If you're talking about a purely retail establishment, and we're talking about inventory management, which our next topic will touch right. on. right. How, how do I know that I'm restocking the right product? Because I'm just going up data and I'm just doing this thing. But I don't really, maybe if I had 10 more of the other one, I would have sold more, yeah. right? But I'm just looking at the data. I'm not looking at, am I looking at how many, how much time you spend on that shelf reading the label? Do you even understand the label? Do I, you understand what's going on in the customer's mind? And when somebody comes over to you, and starts offering you support. How do you feel right. about that? What do you leave feeling when you go out there? You know, those are the things that build loyalty. If, if the customer recognizes that it's a purely transactional relationship, they are always going to be looking. They're elsewhere. right, and and it's it's so important. Um, some of the points that you made: customers are people. Customers have influence, and they have choice. And it's so important. And I've been talking about the customer persona for such a long time. And then when they said customer personality, 
for me, it was another light bulb deep, moment. Deep. Light bulb moment because, yes, you know, it's about their interests, their behaviors, the, the little things that they do that make them who they are. But then that's what their personality is as well. You know, so it was, it's, it was a very enlightening experience. Um, if there are no further questions, I wanted to ask our audience a question. Uh, Mrs. Taylor shared a, a slide where she talked about some key concepts that are to be at the top of mind when we are building customer loyalty. Anybody can just drop it in the chat. Anything that you remember from that particular slide, there were seven um, concepts that were shared. And the first, I just talked about the first one, which was a customer persona, which is crucial, crucial, crucial to how we move forward in building that brand. Anybody can remember any other of the concepts, they can just drop it in the chat. Just to let me know that, yes, Chandri is the customer journey. Fantastic. How did they get to you? What is the context that brought the customer to your business or to your brand? Is very, very important. Look like Chandri is copying the notes, man. <laughs> sure. Lord, Chandri is cancel culture. culture. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. One one of the things that when 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 culture. when Jan told me this when I looked at the presentation this morning and I saw cancel culture I was immediately excited by it because with just one influencer saying one bad thing about your business or your brand it could go all haywire and unfortunately for businesses having observed that you have a space now for influencers and that they are coming in you find that the red carpet is rolled out and, and everything is top, top for them. Right. But the truth is, Normal if you just go some. down to the core, just go down to the core and recognize everybody is an influencer. I don't have to be a person of importance to destroy your business. Yeah. Really. And social so media, social media has changed that landscape totally. You can no longer say, oh, because them named John Brown and um, John is no one, mm -hmm. but you don't know what John's influence is within his own little circle and who John knows can help and to, the to, to, that, to, to the carry that, that message. Is an informal platform because so, um centuries was talking about that some influencers um aren't mindful of what they say yeah i am um, i really wonder sometimes if there is an awareness of of the power they have on somebody's livelihood yeah you know just with either even just ignoring just by not going yeah. you, you can't destroy so at the end of the day, if you were to really, the fact of the matter is that I can come out and I can decide that I'm going to talk about this place without being classified as an influencer. So if we were to look at everybody that walks into the establishment as the next potential ad, unpaid ad, and not, not just to look, look at, at them like that, but just treat them as a decent human being. And, and maybe standardize. The treatment intentional the Inter yeah make intentional it intentional right um i see where chandris is saying they need to need some training in how to talk about business i don't know that we want to go there because, because we want it's free flow yeah it it's free, free flow, flow and unless you're paying them right. which some of them are paid right you don't get into that business right understand that Anybody, if you understand that the consumer or the influence or the person has this power, which they never had before, then you become more mindful of what's going on when I say, are, are we still arguing with customers? You know, we're still arguing with people. No. How do you want your business to be perceived? I, I don't or know. are we trying to understand why is this customer upset? And you, you'll be surprised. We have a thing in Pink Jamaica where we know for a fact that sometimes the most difficult customer in the beginning, when they stop now, when they, you realize it has nothing to do with you, you know, they, they had some stress out on the road before they come in and you are it. You are the team that's going to get it. And you now need to depersonalize that. You need to not make it about yourself, but to get into the empathy mode of, I wonder what's wrong. Yeah. It's tough enough. That's why yeah. you have to be some for some person you have to be 
skilled, you have to be born for it. We are not all made for it. So yeah. I said this to entrepreneurs. If you are not the customer centric person, you are the brilliant child with the identify someone. Identify the skill set that's good with that because yeah. after you do that brilliant product, you still have that to deal with. All right. Question from Tina, Tina Williams. I've learned a lot from this presentation. Can you give me an example how these principles could help someone who owns a shop within a community in the rural area? So for rural businesses, what is very important is culture. Yeah. It's a different sort of culture, a different sort of way of relating. I lived in both rural and urban. And one of the things that happened to me when I transitioned from rural into urban was I was saying good morning and good afternoon to everybody. And people were looking yeah, at me very strangely, yeah. right? Um, rural residents, for want of a bit, don't, don't, there's, there's the Mr. So-and-so and the Mrs. So-and-so. There's a sister So-and-so and the sister So-and-so and it's the first name. So you will definitely have to start to look at how does this community run? We talk about non-traditional means of advertisement, for example, but we still have for rural town crier being the best yeah. since sliced bread, right? And so, it's also emerged as one of the best in the pandemic era as well. There you go. So, yeah. so everything is relative. And, and early in the presentation, Tina, I spoke about context. If you understand the context that your customer group has, and you understand the dynamics of that, that cultural thing, then you will start to see what services you can add on to benefit you in that. It's, it's, there should be nothing that stops you outside of maybe numbers. Yeah, You may have more numbers in the urban community, but if you understand that rural setting and you understand the culture and the way people relate you understand that each rural community has an influencer long back in 19 no long they always had an influencer which is the community where they call it now um, it could be it could be like community village model. Lawyer, village oh, yeah. lawyer they call village them lawyer. and all of that our, our sister P, when sister P say, whatever sister P say. Yeah, if you know, if sister say, it, it, that's how yes. it goes. So it yeah. always existed. <laughs> so I see no difference in terms of the, the, the way we go about um, understanding the relationship dynamics. Mm -hmm. It's maybe just a matter of numbers. Wow. Um, All right. Great presentation this morning, Janine. I think we, you're welcome, Tina. I think we can agree that this has, has been very, very informative. Just want to ask persons, I've posted the link in the chat to the evaluation form, asking you please, just leave with us some of your thoughts so that we know what else we can bring to the table um, for future presentations. Next week, Tuesday, we return with a presentation on inventory management, um, which is also very, very important as we move into um, the next phase of our, of our presentation, because next month be zone now, which is in October, we're gonna look at preparing for the Christmas rush. And so we want to talk about how, how you handle your inventory going into what is expected to be the busy period. I we're hoping, we're praying and hoping for busy, I we're praying and ho hoping for disposable income so that busy can turn into cash right and so we're going to be doing that next week so please fill out the form and let us know what your thoughts are also want to remind you that the session was recorded and will be available on our youtube channel by friday of this week and you can always hit us up on any of our social media platforms facebook instagram linkedin at jbdc jamaica we want to thank janine again for coming and sharing with us this very passionate an informative presentation and we will see you next time on the jbdc virtual biz zone which will be next tuesday at 10 a.m so just look out for the link and register with us again bye have a good day